Welcome to video 19B of module 4 of Accounting 325. All right, so we're going to look at a handful of performance measures in this video. We're going to start with residual income. So residual income represents a return that is measured over in some amount in excess of the expected return. So let's say, for example, you had an operating income of 26000 the net book value of assets was 192500 and the expected return was 12%. Well, if you take the 192.5, which is the net book value, times the expected return of 12%, you'd see that the expectation is a return of 23,100. Since operating income was 26,000, this particular operation, this business activity, has residual income of 2,900, which is the 2,600 minus the 23.1. So residual income allows uh, expected rates to be able to vary between business units depending on expectations. Uh, but in some respects, residual income is inferior to uh, return on investment, which we discussed in the previous video, because it's not scaled by size. So for example, unit A may have residual income of 1.2 million, and unit B may have residual income of 120,000. Uh, but if unit A requires a $10 million investment while unit B requires a $10,000 investment, you can see that you might expect residual incomes to differ by a great deal, but that largely has to do with size. And of course, return on investment scales by assets and therefore scales by size, recalling that the denominator for return on investment is average assets. So, however, you can make return on investment as flexible as residual income by simply saying the target ROI differs between two units. So you could just make unit A's target ROI 10% and unit B's target ROI 6% and you'd get the same sort of flexibility you get with residual income <clears throat> without having to worry about the scaling by size issue. Okay. So the advantages to residual income, it supports incentive to accept all projects with ROI greater than the minimum rate of return, right? So we talked about how that was a limitation of the ROI method. You can use the minimum rate of return to adjust for differences in risk. Uh, so again, you could apply a different rate of return to different business units. Um, however, we just talked about how you can really do that with ROI too. And you can use a different minimum rate of return for different types of assets. So residual income favors large units when minimum rate of return is low. It's not nearly as intuitive of, as ROI, and it can often be difficult to obtain a minimum rate of return at the subunit level. All right, so our next system of performance measure is something called EVA or economic value added. And uh, this is a trademarked uh, type of measurement, but as we're gonna see, um, it's not really that much more complicated than what we've done. So residual income, EVA is just like residual income, except frankly, we just do a better job measuring it because we avoid some of the trappings of generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, what I would argue is managerial accounts should never have been trapped by GAAP to begin with. Uh, recall way back to our very first module where we said managerial accounting is not about external financial statements. And so I'm not sure why we would leverage that unless that was our only choice or it was inexpensive to do so. So income's going to be measured differently than it would be under residual income by measuring this uh, item called no net operating profits after tax. So that's revenues minus cash operating costs, minus depreciation, uh, minus cash taxes on operating income. And I left the minus symbol out there. So really all EVA says, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in the video lecture on this, because really all it says is, hey, you know what? Just be careful when you measure profits and try to capture the most meaningful measure 
for your business. Because what EVA does is it gives you this opportunity to make all these adjustments. It has all these suggested adjustments to profits that you'd measure under some other system. Uh, but beyond that, it's not really much more going on. So to estimate EVA, you have to adjust your accounting numbers and you adjust both the earnings number and you adjust the investment number. And adjustments to the investment number are, are sometimes referred to as equity equivalent adjustments. So and you can see in this chart, we talk about uh, some of the items that you would make to adjust either your investment or your capital or uh, your earnings figure, you know, your profits figure that you're using. So EVA uses a charge for invested capital, uh, which is kind of the same as a minimum threshold. So basically think of it as you're going to calculate your economic value added as what are your profits minus what is the rate of return that we would expect you to earn anyway. And the, that, that charge is often calculated as the weighted average cost of capital. Um, which is kind of like what is the rate that is being paid on common stock, preferred stock, bonds, and other long-term debt to those particular owners of those items. Okay, so let's uh, embark on a little practice exercise to wrap up these performance measurements so we can actually see them in action. So here we have a business that has three divisions, A, B, and C. And you can see I've provided the operating income, the average total assets, and I've also included some information related to some intangibles. So in this case, these patents were self-developed. And if you recall some of your financial accounting, you know that you don't really capitalize the cost of a self-developed patent for the most part. And those costs are expenses they are incurred, but they do, of course, have value once you've created the patent. So we've attributed a value to the patent and we've uh, established some form of effect that that patent has on income. The reason being, of course, we may need to use those when we adjust our profits and our investment numbers, uh, depending on which of these performance measurements we used. So based on this, uh, well, we're not quite done. So there's also a minimum rate of return that the firm has decided is 4.5%. And this firm's uh, weighted average cost of capital is 3.75. And so using this information, we need to calculate the return on investment, the residual income, and the economic value added for each of the divisions A, B, and C. So let's start with uh, return on investment because that is more or less the most basic of the three. So you simply measure the operating income divided by the average total assets uh, in order to get return on investment for each one. And so you can see I've done that for division A, B, and C, and we yield a return on investment of about 5.2%, 9.3%, and 10%. So C clearly has the largest return on investment. So from that performance measure, we would say, hey, C's doing the best. If we use the residual income, where we measure income minus required return, so this, uh, in, instead of simply measuring what is the return on investment, we say, okay, what would the what is the required return, right? So if we had those assets at play and we have a minimum rate of return of 4.5%, what is the required return that we would expect? So that would be like taking the 60 million, multiplying it by 4.5%. We would expect that to generate 2.7 million in earnings. And you can see in division A, we generated 3.1, which means the residual income or the income in excess of the required return is 400,000. We do the same thing for division B, uh, 30 million times 4.5% is 1.35. In uh, income, we have 2.8, residual income of 1.45, and C basically functions the same way. And consistent with our ROI measure, we can see that residual income taps out more or less the same with the C division leading the pack uh, by a substantial margin in this case. So the last one is uh, economic value added. And remember, this represents an economic return minus any charges for capital. 
So noting that EVA required us to make these adjustments, this is when this intangible information is going to come into play. So <clears throat> even though operating income is 3.1 million, the patent effect on that income is 900,000. So economic income is 4 million for Division A. Its average total assets were 60 million, but recall it had a million dollars worth of patents. Uh, and so the total value of assets is 61 million. So we would uh, multiply 61 million by our cost of capital, right? That's our charge for capital that we're charging each division. That's 3.75%. And we would see that uh, that's 2,287,500. So the economic value added is the economic income of 4 million minus the cost of capital charge of 2.287 uh, or 1.712.5. We can do the same thing for divisions B and C. And in this case, we actually see that B, because of the value of the patents, actually has a higher economic value added. So uh, B's operating with these intangibles that are creating significant in income opportunity. And as a result, the economic value added is higher in this case for division B than it would be for C. All right, that brings us to the end of our performance measures part of chapter uh, 19. The next video is all about transfer pricing. Thanks for watching.